Good morning and welcome to everyone joining us now online. It's great to be here and to have you tuning in. Uh, we remind you that today, if you're watching this on Sunday morning, we have our special Zoom call and annual meeting. So be sure to join us at uh, 1030 a.m. With that, uh, we are going to now continue with our series in Hebrews. Our scripture reading today comes from Hebrews chapter 11. As we begin this wonderful chapter in Hebrews, we come to the chapter about faith. Wonderful faith passage. So this is Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through uh, 22, and then verses 39 to 40, just to uh, kind of cap it off. We'll look at the rest of chapter 11 next week. So here's Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's, through this he received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for the place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one is good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, and as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his own son, of whom he had been told, It is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked blessings for the future on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions about his burial. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you. We hear your word and we listen to it and understand it and receive it by faith. And so God, we pray that you would encourage and build up our faith this morning, that we would draw close to you, that your truth would not only be known to us, but would live in us and shape our lives. And God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Faith is the 
foundation for how you live your life. If by faith you think your job is important, you're going to be dedicated to your career. If by faith you think relationships are important, you're going to spend time with family and friends. If by faith you think seeing the world is important, you're going to travel. Well, maybe once those travel restrictions are lifted. But you get the idea. What you, you believe directs how you live your life. Faith is what helps establish all our goals and our dreams. What do you believe is possible? That's faith. And whatever you do to make that possibility a reality, that's done by faith. If someone observed your life for a day, I think they'd get a good sense of what you believe was important. Sometimes we take little steps in our, our life, little steps of faith, things that are just a part of a bigger picture, and other times we take big steps of faith. Maybe when we get married or move to a new town or, or, or make some big decisions. Or maybe you build a ballpark in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you've heard that line from a movie, if you build it, he will come. You know, that was uh, what the voice whispered to Kevin Costner as he walked through a cornfield in the movie Field of Dreams. Anyone see that movie? Yeah, it's a baseball movie. Well, the idea was that if Kevin Costner built a baseball diamond somewhere, well, then, you know, people would just, someone would come and visit him. Now, I won't spoil the ending for you, but he had faith in the boys, and so by faith, he actually, in his cornfield, went and cleared it out and built this ballpark. Suzanne and actually, like, I've actually been there, in fact, and Suzanne and I stopped by on a road trip to my mom's hometown of Minneapolis, and there we were going through Iowa, and uh, she took a couple pictures of me there. I don't know if I can get that in there. Oh, there we go. Whoop, whoop, oh, okay. There we go. We feel the dreams. There's a, this old house, this house with the fence, and there's a ball down in there, and uh, now it's, you know, we, it really is a ball diamond in the middle of an Iowa cornfield. It, it's a tourist attraction, a bit of one. There aren't as many people coming as there were in the movie, uh, but people do visit to look around or play baseball or catch. Uh, but when I was there, what I really wanted to do was disappear in the cornfield, just like in the movie. And, and so that's what I said, Suzanne, take some pictures of me doing that. So I went in and then I dis see how I disappear? That was so neat when that happened for real. But then it was uh, time to go, and Suzanne had to find me, and I don't recommend disappearing if you're on a tight schedule. But uh, in the movie, though, so that, that building, that ball diamond, that was a great leap of faith. Faith in that voice saying, if you build it, he will come. But whether our steps of faith are big or small, whatever we do in life, we do it by faith. And this is how life works with God. When you read the Bible, you see that God's got these great promises of salvation. He'll, he rescues us from sin and death. He gives us this great hope of eternal life, all because of what Jesus has done. But how do you get there? How do you get to claim that promise and have that hope? Well, Hebrews tells us it's by faith. In chapter 10, we were told, For yet in a very little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back, but we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but are among those who have faith and so are saved. There's that great contrast between those who shrink back and those who actually have faith. But faith is the way that we find salvation. Now in chapter 11, we see how crucial faith is and how the Old Testament saints live by faith. And that's what I hope we'll see today, that we too can live by faith and have a hope for heaven. By faith, uh, that hymn we sang a little earlier here, uh, by Peter Townend and Keith and Kristen Getty. That is, uh, has some great lines. I think they probably were inspired by this chapter. I might even borrow some of their lines today. But that great verse from Hebrews 11, that one we know is this, in verse 1. 
Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, maybe you've heard a different translation. Uh, different words are sometimes used for assurance or conviction. Maybe you've heard words like substance or evidence and so on. Well, the Greek word there is actually hypostasis, which is actually a, a pretty important word in a lot of Greek philosophy, but also in Christian theology. Sometimes the, the Trinity, uh, each person of the Trinity, is described as a hypostasis, or an underlying reality. The, the word hupo means under, and stasis is just to stand. So it's really standing under. It's that underlying reality. And so sometimes this is called uh, uh, substance or subsistence of, of something. Now it's saying that faith is the, the hypostasis of things hoped for. And what does this mean? Well, according to Calvin, uh, faith, he says, is the hypostasis, the prop, or the foundation on which we plant our foot. The prop of what? Of things absent, which are so far from being really possessed by us that they are far beyond the reach of our understanding. We have these things that are hoped for, things that are not seen, but what supports our hope? What supports those things? What makes that possible? Well, this is faith. Faith is the foundation for our hope. We can't hope to receive what God has promised, things we can't see, if we don't have an underlying faith. You can't have hope without a faith supporting it. Calvin actually goes on to explain a little longer here, but he says, promise to us is eternal life, but it is promised to the dead. We are assured of a happy resurrection, but we are yet involved in corruption. We are pronounced just, yet sin dwells in us. We hear that we are happy, but we are as good as in the midst of many miseries. An abundance of all good things is promised to us, but still we often hunger and thirst. God proclaims that he will come quickly, but he seems deaf when we cry to him. What would become of us were we not supported by hope, and did not our minds emerge out of the midst of darkness above the world to the light of God's word and of his spirit? Faith, then, is rightly said to be the subsistence or substance of things which are as yet the objects of hope and the evidence of things not seen. We need to have hope, but we can't have that hope without faith. And so we look to a set of examples, a, a, almost a, a hall of fame. If you can imagine yourself walking through the corridors and seeing the pictures of wonderful Old Testament saints on the wall, that's what we do here in Hebrews 11. It says in verse 2, Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Now there are ways to reason our way to the, that knowledge that the world, everything we see, has not always existed, so where did everything come from? Well, it's not from anything that we can see, because there's nothing we can see that's forever. So we could maybe reason our way to an invisible source of the visible but by faith, we already know that. This is by faith, and this is just an introduction to how faith works. Maybe those words from the song, uh, by faith, goes like this. By faith, we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. Interesting how it seems to draw from the creation element, but also that there are people from long ago who walked by faith. And these ancestors, we might say, are really, maybe not our ancestors directly, but they are people of old. They're examples. Now, there might be people you've looked up to in your life for their faith. Maybe you can think of someone who was a, a good neighbor or a teacher, maybe even your own mother or father, who, who really taught you the greatness of, of God and, and shared with you the gospel of Jesus and, and really was a great influence who lived out their faith in a profound way. But here in Hebrews, we do see actually some very common and commonly known examples. You know, we might all have our own personal examples, but these are ones we've all heard of, or for the most part, if we've read the whole Bible. Now, 
why not look at them? Well, Hebrews gives us a great list here. Actually, it says, uh, by faith our ancestors received approval. Well, which are these ancestors, or who are these Old Testament saints? There probably are so many to choose from, but we're given a select group. And for the sake of time, we're only going to look at seven of them from Hebrews 11 today. Now, one nice thing is that they're actually given, though, in chronological order. So we're going to look at Abel, Enoch, Noah, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So those are seven, seven names. But uh, you'll note that Abraham gets the most attention. So we'll spend a little more time there. But let's, let's look at some of these Old Testament saints, shall we? By faith, we start with who? Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Through this, he received approval as righteous, God himself giving approval to his gifts. He died, but through his faith, he still speaks. A lot of people ask, what is it about uh, Abel's sacrifice that was so much better than Cain's? Have you ever wondered what happened to Cain? We remember how uh, Cain killed Abel because he was angry, and he was angry because God accepted Abel's sacrifice instead of his own. But we might wonder, what was it exactly that made his sacrifice so much better? Now this is how Genesis 4 leads off with the birth of Cain and then Abel. And he says, I pronounced or produced a man with the help of the Lord. The word help of uh, is not really in the Hebrew. It's just, I produced a man. And then it says, the Lord, the Lord's name. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery there. But it's not a bad interpretation. Eve has this human, and then she has another son, Abel. Now, Abel, they both had different jobs. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Cain a tiller of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the first fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And so Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And then, of course, one thing leads to another. Now we can look at this and say, well, what was it that made Abel's offering better? And people have theorized different things. Some say, well, Abel gave the first of his flock. Maybe Cain didn't. Or Abel gave a, an offering that was a, an animal sacrifice, and that was better than a grain offering. Although, even in the Old Testament, there were offerings that were not always animal offerings, and those were acceptable to God, too. So there's been this bit of a mystery to this. But you know the answer given to us in Hebrews 11? At least the underlying reason, the big difference between Abel and Cain's offering is this. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Whatever Abel did, he did it by faith. And that was a distinguishing feature or aspect of his offering. When Cain made his offering, Abel made his, Abel made his by faith. And whether that's essentially the difference or it just made his offering better and, and how he did it or what he offered, it was faith that made the fundamental, foundational difference. And he's just one example. Faith made the difference for, for Abel. What about the next example, Enoch? Now, he's not someone we, we read too much about, but we're told that he was taken up, so he didn't experience death. He was not found because God had taken him. Now, this all draws from a very small part in Genesis 5, and it, there's not much really said about Enoch. It says Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And then the one verse, Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him. And just from that one verse is really the basis of, there's actually more written about him in Hebrews, <laughs> perhaps than originally in the book of Genesis. But what do we infer from that? Well, he walked with God, and so that meant what did he do? Well, he pleased God. And God took him, so he was no more on the earth. But what does that tell us? 
Well, it shows us that he had not only pleased God, but he did not experience death. Now, now, if it said that Enoch walked with God and God made sure he died at a certain age, that, that's not very encouraging. But God did something different here. After this list of many people in Genesis who lived and died, Enoch comes up and says, God took him, which suggests there's something different. He managed to go from life and to, to his afterlife without the common experience of death that we normally would face. What is that like? We don't get a lot of explanation. I like to think of it kind of like that time I, I disappeared in a cornfield. You know, I just kind of just faded away. But we don't really know. We don't really know. We just know one thing, though, that this points to an afterlife. It points to, there's no point in saying God made Enoch's life shorter on earth if all that matters is life on earth. There must be a life to come for that to matter. And so we know that this is pointing to an afterlife here. Next example, we have Noah. He's a little more famous, is he not? By faith, Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning, and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. So Noah needed faith for his actions, just like we all do. You don't do uh, build amazing things or, or uh, do very different things if you don't believe it's for a purpose, for a good end. And, and that's, you know, Noah's given it as an example of that, another great example of faith. And then finally, we come to Abraham, which is a lot bigger. Right? A lot is said about Abraham. He's sometimes considered really the, the father of faith. If anybody had faith, we look to Abraham as probably a prime example. But it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Now, Abraham did a number of things here. I won't read this all again. But you'll notice that he obeyed when he was told to leave one place and go to another, which is a, a very daunting task. Some of us have not always lived in Ontario, for example, and we moved to a new place. That can be a, a big challenge. Maybe you've gone from one country to another. But he did that because God told him to. And by faith he stayed for a time in a land that had been promised as a foreign land. He, he lived in that place by faith. He looked forward, though, to uh, something else. He looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God, and by faith he received the power of procreation. So God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And what did Abraham do? He believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Therefore, for one person, as good as dead, descendants were born. Now, there's a bit of a break here in, in clarifying some of this about Abraham, a little intermission. It says this, All these people died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, they could have just gone back. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. So what we see in all of these examples, we see these little hints. We see this hint even in Abel, that his blood, as it cried out to God, well, his faith still cries out to us. Enoch, he didn't die, but he still lives on. And in Noah, he saved people. We have this image of salvation in Noah. All of these things tied to faith. And even Abraham had this idea that, you know what my home is? This world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm looking forward to something better. There was a promised land. But the point here is that these people really are looking for something better than what this world is has to offer. And it's like the words of that song, by faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts, of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. You see, 
Abraham not only believed that he would inhabit a land, he believed in life after death too. Where do we see this faith of Abraham that he believed in resurrection? Well, it says, by faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom he had been told, it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. Now you can do the math. Isaac has not had any children, yet through Isaac, Abraham's going to become a grandfather, great-grandfather, the father of many descendants, like the stars in the sky or the sea, sand on the seashore, through this Isaac. But if Isaac is gone, if Isaac dies, how is it possible that, that Isaac will be uh, the one through whom all these descendants will come? If Isaac sacrificed, how is this possible? Well, it is he considered, this is what Abraham did, he considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. Abraham, if he's going to sacrifice the one through whom all his descendants are going to come, and, and Isaac's going to be dead, yet he's also going to bring all these descendants, Isaac's going to have descendants, how is that going to work? Well, God must bring Isaac back from the dead. Abraham, therefore, had faith in the resurrection. And it's not hard to draw the, the many links between Isaac and, and Jesus. He is an only son. He carries the wood for his own sacrifice. He is the one who is to die and to rise again. We can see how much Isaac himself even points us to Jesus. But here he is. Abraham believed. He believed in life after death. He believed that something better was yet to come. And that's why he could go through this. By faith, the prophet saw a day when the longed-for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. The faith in life after death with Enoch, faith in resurrection, these were elements of faith for the Old Testament saints. People believed this before Jesus even appeared and was born. They believed. They had faith and they lived by it. A few more examples as we, we finish this up. By faith, Isaac invoked blessings on the future for Jacob and Esau. And then he also blessed the sons of Joseph. Jacob, rather, blesses the sons of Joseph. That's in Genesis 48. And then by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions about his burial. That's Genesis 50. That's the end of Genesis, by the way. Now that's the faith maybe in the smaller promises of the older, older, an older covenant in which they'd inherit land. But the faith was there. The point is that these people long ago had faith. They believed and it affected how they lived whether it meant they moved to a new land or they uh, were willing to obey God in some extraordinary way, like Abraham's test. But all of these were tests or aspects of faith. And so we see this here as, as God's people, that first statement. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. These Old Testament people received their approval because they had faith. And faith, as we know, is the whole basis for our hope. It's the basis for those unseen promises as of yet. We look forward to those. But notice what hope it is. These saints had hope for life after death. They had hope for heaven. They had this hope for a heavenly city that God would establish. And don't we need hope in these strange times when people struggle with mental health? They don't know what's coming. They, they don't know uh, how their health will be. People are afraid of getting sick. People are afraid of losing their job or not getting their job again. There is stress in the family home because things aren't going so well. People are not living the way they want to live. And it all just builds up on people. 
And then people disagree on what should be done, and then you have conflict, even in families. Should you say hi? Should you not? Should you visit or not? Different people have different standards, and that can create issues too. Don't we need hope for something better than what this world has to offer? But we can have that hope when we remember that it's based on faith. People like hope, but people don't always like faith. Sometimes people say, oh, faith. What, what is faith anyway? Isn't that just believing things without proof? Well, it's not. Well, it can be believing something you can't be absolutely sure of as though you can see it or hold it in your hand. But faith is really a relational thing. It's a matter of trust. When someone says, I will do something, and you believe them, that's a relational sort of thing. That's faith in someone. When we say, for example, um, I believe in you, I'm not just saying, hey, I believe you exist, right? You say you trust that person. You trust in their ability and in, in their, their sincerity and honesty. You trust in the person. And we believe in God. Yes, we have to believe that God is real first, but we also believe that God, as it says, will reward those, that God is not only real, but really wants to bless his people. And that's what we need as God's people, as anyone today. But one thing we know, too, is, is how we accept, access all these blessings from God is by faith. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. Whose approval is that? It's God's approval. In other words, People may have lived their life in one way or another. They may have done the right thing sometimes, the wrong things other times. They have not lived a perfect life, and neither have you. But if you want God's approval, you won't be getting it by showing God your resume and saying, look at all how I've lived a perfect life. It's going to be because you have faith. You have faith. And all these little actions that, that go into faith or what proof your faith? Now, what would you say you do by faith in your life? That's probably the challenging question, isn't it? We do all sorts of things every single day, but how many of them are really because we have faith in God's promise and in the, His Son that He sent for us? Now, maybe you've done something big to become a Christian. Right? That's a big step of faith, right? If you are just living a life with a bunch of other people and you say, I'm going to turn my life into living for Christ now, that is a big step. It's a, an amazing, wonderful thing. It's a leap of faith probably for many, but it is a big, big step, and it's a good faith. It's a good step to go right into faith. But for most of us, maybe you're just doing the little things like taking time to pray in the morning, or reading a chapter of the Bible each night before you go to bed, or even maybe you're listening to a message like this one. You got up, you said, hey, I'm going to listen to this, and, and you, no one would think, wow, you must have so much faith to do that. Well, it's still a, it's still a step of faith, isn't it? I assure you, not everybody's taking time do that. Not everybody's taking time to pray or read the Bible or listen to a message. See, not every step of faith is a big one, but it's still living by faith. The little things you do each day. Things like loving God, like keeping His commandments, even when others don't. Sometimes that will make you stand out a lot. Other times it's very easy to do. But you do that. But you also, all along, you're keeping your eyes on the hope of heaven. That, that hope that's supported by faith. This is living by faith. Faith in the God who is always faithful. All praise and glory be to God forever. Amen. <laughs>
let us live by faith in our actual promises of our loving God. And let us go with God's blessing. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of our